Team, what is up? Thank you so much for joining us on this week's episode. We currently have a special running, buy one, get one free on our meal plans until this Sunday. So Sunday, the 15th of December is the last day for you guys to get in on that one. It is a buy one, get one free. So if you buy one meal plan, 199 is all it costs you, you'll get a person you'll get two personalized meal plans um, directly to your inbox, which is really cool. And I mean, obviously, this time of year is a hectic time of year to be buying products in general for yourself or anything for in, in general because it's uh, Christmas and it's just hectic time of year but I mean it's a pretty good deal for you moving into the new year in particular to set you up for success come 2020 so if you want to get on to the buy one get one free all you need to do is go to www.thechieflife.com and select personalized meal plans follow through buy yourself a program and we'll get two out to you once again that's www.thechieflife.com thanks so much team enjoy this this episode. Alrighty, guys, welcome back to the Chief Life Podcast. I am Matthias Turner, and today I'm excited. I have Jonathan Levy with me. Jonathan, welcome. Hey, thanks so much for having me, Matthias. So I'm pretty pretty pumped for this one. We've done a lot of talks with doctors recently, a lot of talks into health and um, nutrition and that side of things. So it's cool to kind of change it up and go back onto the the mind and memory side of things again. And we have interviewed uh, Anthony Mativier before, which is kind of down the same sort of route. And you guys actually have a, a thing together, which is called Branding You Academy. Um, so that's one place to look out. But I mean, to give you a bit more of a rundown, um, you run Superhuman Academy, You've written a book, which is the only skill that matters. You've got the super, uh, super, uh, sorry, superhuman academy podcast, as well as the super. I get them confused too. Let me yeah, tell you, <laughs> super learner academy. So I mean, there's so much going on there. Um, what I'd love to know, Jonathan, is actually just a little bit about your story because I heard you say once that you've never actually had a job that you didn't pay for yourself, which I think is kind of cool. That is true, yes. Uh, so my name is Jonathan Levy. I'm uh, uh, an entrepreneur, serial entrepreneur, uh, thought leader in the memory and learning space, author, podcaster, all that other stuff. Uh, growing up, I had a really happy childhood until I didn't, uh, as, as I think most people would say. Um, really happy kid, lots of hobbies, you know, good friends, wonderful parents. Uh, always had a really hard time paying attention in school. Mm-hmm. And it was cute again, until it wasn't. Uh, Along about second grade, so that's eight years old for the non-Americans in the audience, uh, my parents started wondering, you know, something's not right, things aren't connecting. I remember in first grade, I I just couldn't get reading a clock. I remember this distinctly. It's one of my first memories of school. I just could not get this whole reading a clock thing, and I was going in, spending extra time with the teacher, trying to figure out, you know, other kids were understanding something that I wasn't. And um, by second grade, my uh, my teachers. Is it freezing up for you? It is. You we might, no, we might just um, shut down the video. That's cool. Your call. Yeah, yeah. Let's shut it down. It's just not. It just froze up as soon as we started recording. Cool. No worries. So by second grade, it had become a real problem, and my teacher at the time uh, was a special ed teacher before. So my parents took the opportunity. They got me tested. Results weren't promising. They decided not to medicate me at that time. Um, but school just continued to get harder and harder and harder. I made it through elementary school because I had really patient teachers. But by the time I got to middle school, even my easiest quote unquote subjects were really, really hard. And so I was not only struggling in the classroom, but also outside of the classroom with the other types of skills that other kids were learning, social skills, um, romantic skills, sports skills. And it plunged me into this really, really deep self-hatred and depression Mm. for a few years. uh, I contemplated suicide for a while. And the only thing that really brought me out was, well, two things. One, a friend introduced me to Ritalin, which I tried and then Mm -hmm. promptly marched home and said, mom, dad, I need this if you want me to stay in school. You know, because outside of school, I was great. But in school, not so much. And two, I discovered entrepreneurship. Uh, In my life, I've had two job interviews. The first one was for Togo's. The second was for Jamba Juice. I didn't get either of the jobs. So I went home and I started a uh, seven-figure e-commerce business, uh, selling luxury car parts on the internet, believe it or not. I love that. That's um, awesome. And that's how I got through college and high school. I, I rediscovered my self-esteem through entrepreneurship. And uh, my trick for, for dealing with the academic part, which I still was not very good at, 
was if I couldn't pay attention and and get it like other kids did in class and sit still, then I would just take a bunch of medication, go home and catch up and hmm. lock myself in my bedroom till 9 p.m. every night. Um, and that worked until I got accepted to business school, at which point I realized that wasn't going to work because I needed to actually socialize and network. And it was it was very fortunate at that time I discovered two people who mentored me in accelerated learning, speed reading, and memory. And the rest, as they say, is history. Once I, I learned that there were ways to learn better, I then turned those skills that I'd acquired into learning more about how we learn and how the brain works and memory and learning and hacking my biology. And uh, I've just been on this crazy seven-year journey of learning as much as I can about how to improve the human condition uh, and experience yeah, that's cool. I mean, casting it back a few years back to when you were at school still, was the motivation to learn based on pretty much based on the fact that you didn't want to get left behind or was there another external motivator that kind of made you want to go home and maybe particularly, oh, sorry, take something like Ritalin to keep you up to scratch? Well, I come from a family that really cherishes learning, uh, mm -hmm. both inside and outside the classroom. I would say both of my parents are avid learners. My dad is 75 years old. He's still learning languages, and he's still mm -hmm. going to men's debate groups, and my mom is always learning new skills and, and hobbies. So I come from a, a long line of prolific learners, and, and I think that was the sin of it, and, and that was what was so stark for me, was learning was fun outside of school. Why wasn't learning fun in school, mm -hmm. and, and why was it such a drag? and why was it so uh, tedious and painful? Um, so I think part of it was, you know, I grew up in a household that really cherished education and it, there was never any doubt that I was going to get a master's degree. It was just that that's just what it was, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and, and even though my parents clearly knew I was going to be an entrepreneur, it was made clear to me from day one, like that is, that's just what we do in this family. We, we get education and I really respect that. Uh, though I have, you know, some issues with the way the education system works. I really mm. respect that, it, that in my household, education was a given. Um, and I think that that was a big part of it, but also just realizing, uh, that, you know, I needed knowledge. I think I, I pretty quickly realized that knowledge was going to be the key to whatever it was I wanted to achieve. Um, and, and that I needed to acquire knowledge, whether that be in the classroom or outside of it. Yeah, so I think the knowledge game has kind of really changed in the last few years. We've got podcasts, YouTube channels, I mean, even TV and movies and bits and pieces that can give you knowledge as well as your university degrees, as well as things like Udemy, which you did incredibly well on. Um, and I mean, even going back to books. So when, when this all was kind of unraveling for you, were books the main source of, of learning? After school or during school? Well, both, yeah. Like, I guess I guess to start with, when you were in the stages of not learning very well, was it all through book work? Yes. And I think that's part of the issue. I mean, one of the things I talk about in, in the new book, The Only Skill That Matters, is this idea of brute force learning, mm. which is learning from as many different sources as possible, whether that's books, podcasts, online courses, tutors, documentaries, I mean, really attacking a subject from as many angles as possible. I think in school, we're taught uh, this kind of flawed framework. And I don't think it's intentional. I think it's just uh, it, it's just the way that the system works, right? You have the book and you have the lecture, but they're kind of teaching the same thing. So you're not getting multiple perspectives on something. And what that teaches you is that learning is something that happens once. You don't know something, you learn it then you are supposed to know it. Hmm. And it doesn't work like that. No. Like, show me a subject in any situation. I mean, would you want a doctor who sat in one lecture <laughs> or read one textbook performing open heart surgery on Hell you? no. <laughs> um, and, 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 you know, in the things that matter, look, for example, at like, okay, kids get their driver's license at age 16 where I grew up. And, you know, they have to sit through a bunch of different classes, then they have to do online simulators, then they have to be driven with an instructor, then they have to drive with an instructor, then they have to drive with a parent, then they have to pass an exam. I mean, there's like 15 different ways that they learn these skills. And yet when it comes to, okay, we're going to learn history, just read chapter seven and we'll talk about it tomorrow. Mm. And it doesn't, you know, it doesn't work like that. And so what I love about this idea of brute force learning, which I actually learned from uh, Matan Griffel in an online course he was teaching, 
it, it teaches you, first off, it allows you to complete your knowledge, right? And round out any, any missing areas. But the other thing is it teaches you that it's okay not to learn the first time. It's yeah. okay not to get it the first time. And it, it brings down that pressure because if I read the textbook and I go, I have no freaking idea <laughs> what, you know, what this person's talking about. I can always go on and watch a lecture on Khan Academy or listen to a podcast. And, and it, people need to understand that that's okay. Mm. In fact, that's encouraged. And the third benefit of this idea of brute force learning is spaced repetition. So we know that it's not enough to learn something once. If we want it to stick, we have to learn it over and over and over and over, right? Uh, Herman Ebbinghaus called this over learning. And we know that it's more effective. You, your memories will last longer the more you've repeated them. And that makes sense. And yet we don't do it. We yeah. learn something once, we take the exam, and then we walk out of the exam and we forget it. Mm. How about like the whole concept concept of uh, learning it? Sorry, yeah, learning it yourself and then teaching it to someone. Have you found that that is a, a, a useful method? Absolutely. In fact, it's one of the most scientifically backed methods mm -hmm. for improving learning. In the book, I talk a lot about self testing as one phenomenal way. Again, really scientifically backed, incredibly well. Uh, on on how to improve your learning, but the reality is most people don't want to create their own tests, much less take them. And so the chapter after that, I talk about the power of teaching as a vehicle for learning because when you're teaching, think about it, it's just other people are testing you. I mean, if you have an active and engaged learner, they're going to ask you questions. They're going to poke holes in your knowledge. They're going to say, wait a minute, okay, you said that this happened because of this, but then why didn't, you know, to take World War II. Well, then, okay, why didn't the Soviets do this? And you go, I don't know why the Soviets mm -hmm. didn't attack from that front. Let's go look it up, right? So someone has now tested your knowledge and poked holes in it and found areas that you need to improve your knowledge. So Richard Feynman, who, in my opinion, was, was one of the greatest learners of all time, uh, this was his method. It's called the Feynman technique. And he would learn something, summarize it, pretend that he was teaching it, Hmm. figure out if he was ready, go out and teach it, revise again. And so he did these feedback loops of teaching and learning. And it is, as you said, Matthias, one of the most effective ways to improve learning. Yeah, I actually, um, something that I've been doing a lot of recently is creating more YouTube videos. And it's not necessarily things that I'm really well rounded in until I do the YouTube video and it starts to give me a lot more of a grasp as to what it is like I'll, I'll read it i get it all documented up for me i'll read through it and then I'll, I'll pretty much piece it out as a youtube video and then it's almost like once i re-watch the youtube video once we've finalized it as well that's when it all kind of comes together it's like okay well i've now i've read it i've re-talked it myself i've taught it through re-talking it myself and then i've gone and listened to it again it almost just solidifies the whole thing it's really cool absolutely yeah absolutely um and so i mean a lot of people talk about speed reading. Um, this is only, obviously only one part of it. So, so many people talk about, well, if you want to in increase your knowledge base, you need to be able to learn more. You need to be able to read faster to be able to take it in. How do you retain all of, the, all of it once you've got it there? Like obviously speed reading is only one part of it. So how do we get to the stages of being able to retain and increase your memory as well? Yeah, that's a great question. So when I encountered Lev, who was one of my tutors, I had already done two different speed reading methods. I'd done Evelyn Wood's seven day speed reading program, <laughs> and I'd done the PX method. And I indeed was able to read 450 words per minute, but my comprehension was 40%. Hmm. Yeah. So what good is that? And what Lev impressed upon me was that in order to improve your speed, you really need to first improve your memory and learn how to use your memory properly. So what they had me do was train memory techniques and learn how to improve my memory. And so to this day, in the courses that I teach, we have students spend up to four weeks improving their memory and learning all the kinds of stuff that both Anthony Mativier, our mutual friend, and I teach. Uh, which are mnemonic techniques and how to review your memories and how to create visualizations. And at the higher levels, if you really want perfect knowledge of the book, you can even create memory palaces, though I think it's often overkill to create a memory palace for reading. Mm -hmm. Once you've learned these skills, and also other skills, by the way, like pre-reading and, and all these other things that improve your comprehension, you're then ready to speed read. And the, the key here is 
you're still doing the same memory techniques. So yeah. you want to speed read something. Well, first, let's go through the whole process. You want to pre-read something, which is kind of scanning it really quickly, generating interest and curiosity, taking note of interesting things that stand out. Uh, really, you're just priming your brain and improving your concentration. So do you mean that for a whole then, book or is that just a page? No, you would do that. You would do that 10, 15, 20 pages ahead. Okay. No more. Yeah. You would then speed read with enhanced focus because you're paying attention and asking yourself, well, where was that thing that I saw before? And was my assumption before correct? You're, you're really leveraging cognitive biases mm -hmm. towards, uh, increasing your focus. When you get to the end of each page, as you're turning the page, you want to think and visualize what did I see? What, you know, what are the, what are my visualizations when you get to the end of the chapter, or if it's a long chapter, you know, do this every 10, 15, 20 pages, you want to review those mental markers again. So we're, we've already gone through three times and reviewed what's in the text. And then periodically, I'm not against highlighting, by the way, periodically, you want to go back and either review your highlights or flip through the book and do that spaced repetition again. Mm hmm. By doing that, you're not going to remember all the visualizations that you created. You know, people think when I talk about 100% comprehension in my courses or in our marketing, I'm not talking about being able to recite the book word for word or remember mm. every single detail. What I am talking about is being able to understand every major point and idea and how it's constructed and and be able to really give the full summary of the book. Mm. Yeah, that's cool. And so, I mean, have you ever met actually anyone who has a fully photographic memory? Someone who, like, I mean, they really make it out in, uh, for instance, something like Suits, a TV series. I don't know if you've seen it, where um, the, the main yeah. character has this incredible photographic memory that he can remember everything once he sees it once. Has, is that something that you've come across in individuals in themselves? Yeah, I have really good news for you. Everyone listening in the audience <laughs> has a photographic memory. You just don't know how to use it yet. Uh, and that's really what we teach people. We, we train people because, look, we know from study after study after study that images are more effective as a way to remember. They're significantly more effective than any other means of remembering, that they're faster to remember, and that anyone and everyone can be trained to use the same techniques and actually rewire their brain to look like that of a memory champion. Now, memory champions, there's really only one way to do this. You know, when you're getting to the elite level, people who are <clears throat> memorizing a deck of cards in 13 seconds, the only way to do that is with visualization and things like the memory palace technique. Mm -hmm. And we know from, again, study after study, first that anyone can develop that skill and change their brain to work in that way. But more recent studies have even shown that memory may be inextricably linked to location and visual imagery, mm -hmm. mental imagery. There have been studies that have shown that you can't actually recall a memory without lighting up the part of your brain that's involved in visualization and location, hmm. which is pretty cool. So it, it paints this whole new picture of, you know, there are so many people out there who've been telling themselves all their lives, I'm an auditory learner, I'm a tactile kinesthetic learner. We're all visual learners, all of us. And so what we teach in our programs is how to tap into that visual memory, which in most people has been lying dormant for decades, and to teach you how to use it for anything and everything. Wow. That's so cool. There's a, yeah, wow. That, that kind of uncovers a lot, doesn't it? It does. It does. And people are people are blown away when they see what they can do. I think um, I always like to joke with people, you know, it's only impressive until you know how it's done. Mm. So if I tell you, hey, you know, give me 50 digits and I'll memorize them and I'll recite them back to you backwards and forwards. For most people, that's an impressive feat. But once you know how it's done, it's no more impressive than reading it off a piece of paper. <laughs> you know, I'm just the piece of paper for me is in my mind. Yeah. And, uh, and, and we're naturally wired to do this. I mean, we have incredible, incredible memories. Uh, we just don't, literally don't know how to use our memory. I mean, when I see someone reviewing flashcards and reciting it in their head, and, and I see you know them they're whispering under their lips like, okay, this word means this. Okay, repeat it, repeat it. <laughs> it just pains me because you're doing it, you're doing it the hard way. Yeah. You know, it really just goes. imagine, let, I'll give you an example, yeah, to, uh, Matthias. Imagine if I wanted to describe a situation to you yeah. and I wanted to describe it to you over the uh, phone. 
And I said, okay, well, there's this guy and he's, uh, he's holding this woman and he's wearing a sailor hat and he's hugging her and he's like kissing her. And then the background, it's like, one, it's not very memorable. Two, it's going to take me forever to communicate to you. Whereas if I just text you the image and you mm. see it, there it is, right? It's, it's instantly conveyed to you. Yeah. It's highly memorable to you. And that, that's how visual memory works and why it's so much, so much more superior. So what's the best way to do some form of visual memory, I guess, um, or visual learning when it's just given to you as a written form only? Like, are you best to try to picture something that resonates with you or are you best to try picture the room that you're in? Like, going back to what you're saying about the area and location that you're in, what, what is the best way to kind of make that work for you? Yeah, great question. So the master skill, the the really foundational skill that everyone needs to learn is this idea of what we call in the super learner method, visual markers. So it means anything that I want to remember, I need to turn into a visualization, right? A novel picture, ideally one, as, as you alluded to, one that's connected to my existing knowledge. So mm -hmm. the visualization is comprised of different things that I know about, that I remember, that have meaning to me, and ideally reasonably ridiculous visualizations, silly, violent, uh, sexual, bizarre, just because that's going to make them more memorable. Sticks out, yeah. Now, anything I want to remember, whether that's foreign language words, Bible verses, poems, numbers, names, faces, decks of cards, anything that you can imagine, there's a way to convert that into a visual symbol. Um, so it all starts there. Once you have that skill, you can get into the next level stuff like memory palaces and, and ways of organizing those visual markers in highly memorable ways that you're less likely to forget. Mm. Yeah, wow. That's really cool. Um, and so, I mean, a lot of your book really, does it really dive into this? I, I'm, I apologize because I haven't actually read your book, which makes me a bad podcast. Totally fine. Yeah. But, uh, no, well, that's fine. I do the same thing because that way I ask beginner questions. Well, to be honest, I actually find it the, the podcasters or the interviewers then – <laughs> they almost put a test and if they do a good job I'll go and read the book so that's typically the, <laughs> the task is um, oh, that's good yeah I like, I like it I like it. No, it it works quite often that after I've talked to someone I'll go and read the book anyway because they, they generally sell me on it so yeah <laughs> awesome well I'll try to bring my A game you, for the you, rest you're of the doing interview. well so far you're doing very good um so, I mean, a lot of the book, it, it kind of dives deep into these memory side of things. But what's, what's the difference between um, the book and going in and doing the academy? Oh, that's a big question. So, uh, the academy really uh, is going to take you step by step, hold your hand every step of the way. You're going to have accountability. You're going to get to set your goals with one of our certified coaches. Um there's going to be worksheets and interactive games and it's really it's it's think of it as a complete step by step every day we're with you for 10 weeks mm -hmm. uh the book is is really something that i want to i mean my mission is to get these tools in the hands of a million people yeah and uh it's hard to do that at a thousand dollars per person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, the book is really a way to get out there. The book is, by the way, for anyone considering reading it, I made it as short as possible. I know, you know, there's the irony of it is like people come to me cause they don't have enough time to read <laughs> and they read slowly and they need help. So what good would it be to write them a 400 page book? <laughs> and so I worked with my editor to get this thing as svelte as humanly possible. It's 197 pages. Wow. You can read it in an afternoon and it will give you all the tools you need to go out and start doing this on your own. If you want to take it to the next level, you want to make these second nature and, and really get to a point where you think in pictures and you can remember anything with, with almost no effort come back to me for superhuman academy and we'll we'll take very good care of you but the book is meant to give you all the tools that you need to do this and it's i mean my goal is to get this book in a million people's hands and what about for the folks that don't uh that don't read like for instance we've got some dys dyslexic crew that listen um do like is there a variation an audible variation or anything like that for them yeah, the audio book is in production now. Awesome. Uh, I'm not exactly sure when it'll be out, but it should be out in the next couple of months. That's super cool. 
I'll uh, I'll keep them posted on that then as it comes through. That's really good. Um, cool. So, I mean, when it comes through... Actually, no. What I want to dive into is we, we've talked a lot about the actual learning side of things, but making an individual, uh, I guess... In, inspired enough to do it be motivated enough to actually do it it's almost like what comes down to productivity tips um like what are the best things to get people actually in the moment and ready to do what they're meant to be doing yeah you know i I have a friend ben hardy who says like if people are struggling to achieve their goals then they just don't know what they want Mm -hmm. enough right because if i think it ultimately comes down to why and, and this is why every single one of my courses, I mean, obviously, I, I, I know a little bit about how people learn and why they learn and what happens in the brain when people are learning uh, well versus not learning well. And this is why every single one of my courses and, and the courses that I build for other people as, as a consultant, they always start with goal setting and why. Mm-hmm. I have people free write. And I know it sounds – it might sound to people – you know, fluffy and woo woo. And, but I have people write about why. Yeah. And oftentimes, I mean, there's, there's really only a few reasons human beings do things, right? It's pleasure or avoidance of pain. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, there's flavors, right? So I like to get people to journal, like, how are you going to improve your life if you develop this skill and really get into it? I mean, really write like, okay, great. I'm going to be a better dad because I'm going to be able to, you know, finish work an hour early every day because I'm not stuck reading all my emails, you know, till 7 PM. Uh, I'm going to be a, a better friend because I'll remember birthdays and names and, and kids names. And so really thinking about what's in it for you, because the different, you know, sure, I'd love to speak Mandarin, mm. but it, it's not, it's not actually going to make my life any better, which is why I've never put in any effort to speaking Mandarin. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, at the end of the day, what's actually going to get people to do what they say they want to do is self-interest. Mm-hmm. It, 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 and it doesn't have to be pure self-interest, right? It can be self-interest. I want to be you know, a, a better son, father, husband, business leader, whatever it is. But at the end of the day, you have to really see the light at the end of the road in order to stick with it. Because I'm the first to say our, our programs aren't easy. You know, you're not, you don't get to sit there and watch 20 minutes of video a day and then go off on your merry way. It's, <laughs> I want you practicing and doing things and writing and exercises and testing yourself. And, you know, so what is going to get you over the line? And, and at the end of the day, you, you need to know, you need to start with the why, as Simon Sinek says. And, and I've always found that to be one of the best productivity hacks out there, right, is I, I even tell students, write it out, pin it up, pin it up in your workspace so that next time when you're looking at your computer and you have a choice between opening up my course and pra- you know spending 10 minutes practicing your memory before your next meeting and seeing if you can memorize 50 digits or whatever it challenge you're currently on versus opening up a YouTube video before your next meeting, what are you going to choose? And and also I want to add one thing that, that recently blew my mind. I finally got around. I know I'm like the last person on planet earth to finally read this book, uh, atomic habits. Yeah. It's awesome. James clear. Yeah. And he espouses this idea, which I, I know from Benjamin Hardy as well, that actually our, self-image is not formed based on ancient history. Our self-image is really flexible and malleable. And it's based on what we've been doing the last few weeks. Mm -hmm. So it literally, I mean, habits are a different thing and we can talk about habits, but I'll give you an example. I was doing a challenge with my mastermind, uh, for, for my, uh, my private mastermind and Ben Hardy led the challenge. And I decided that for that challenge, I was going after 15 years, I was going to become a morning workout person. Now I, Maddie have been saying for years and years and years, like my body is just not meant to work out in the morning. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. But I decided to challenge that because his whole, you know, all his stuff is about psychology and changing. And, and at the end of a about four weeks, I was leaving the gym at 827 in the morning (laughs) after having done a brutal workout. And I looked up and the sun was out and I looked at my watch and I said, yes, I have 30 minutes to, you know, to shower and get home. And and, like, I'm not in a rush and my workout is already done. I don't have to do shit tonight. 
And I was like, thank God I'm a morning workout person. And I like literally double took. <laughs> like, I'll never forget it. I, I literally was like, what did you just say? Like, who's in my head, you know? <laughs> and that was it. It was sig- He calls it signaling. And, and, and James Clear says the same thing, yeah. right? Because the research shows it. So, so all the thought leaders are, are, are on board with this. And he articulates it so beautiful, beautifully, mm. which is if you are shaping your own self-image based on recent activity, then every action you take and every decision you make is a vote for the person you want to be. Yeah, I and I think that's it. so amazing, right? Because it's so easy to say, ah, what's one cupcake? It's one cupcake. But it's like, is this the kind of person I want to be? Mm-hmm. Is this who I want to believe I am? And chances are you don't want to be the kind of person who every time cupcakes show up in the office caves. Yeah. So I, I think that's really powerful. And I just tell myself that, you know, I say, look, Jonathan, there's this cupcake. It's delicious. You're at a wedding. It would be so easy to say, hey, it's a celebration. Let's celebrate your buddy's wedding and whatnot. But do you want to be this kind of person who's always compromising? Do you want to be the kind of person who's weak? And the answer is no. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Um, something that we really dive into a lot with our nutrition clients, like in particular nutrition coaching clients, is the why. Because realistically, I think it comes down to everything in life. Like if you don't have a purpose, a passion, and a reason as to why you're doing everything you're doing, you're always going to find the easier way out, that easier route to take. Um, and I think it's just so like it might be overdone but at the same time it's overdone because it works like if people can actually dive in and really figure out what their why is they're going to get so much more out of their life at yeah least- i agree i heard someone say i think it might have been joe DeSena, uh but joe polish always quotes this so i don't know who the ac- originator is but it's and i'm going to butcher the quote i promise you but mm-hmm. it's uh your life gets easier in proportion to the number of hard decisions you make mm. and it gets harder in proportion to the number of easy decisions you make. Yeah. I actually Which have, I think is so great. Yeah, like you you're sorry, go ahead. I was going to say I've heard that and I think it was Joe DeSanna. Yeah, you're if you always make the easy decision to eat that cupcake 20 years from now your life is going to be really hard. I don't wish that on anyone. You mm. know, I I have family members who have diabetes. I don't wish it on anyone. Um, but if you make a lot of hard decisions today, I recently learned, you're going to like this, Maddie. Um, I did one of those calculators that, you know, how long am I going to live based on my current life choices? Yep. And I learned that because I work out and not every week, but usually three to four times every week, I gained back two years of my life. That's awesome. Which is, that's like a pretty good reason to work out, mm-hmm. right? Along with all the other benefits, right? Uh, but I mean, that leads right, me to actually right. a question that I wanted to ask you was how much do you feel that health comes into play when it's talking about memory and being able to perform better on a day-to-day basis with like, I mean, something that we talk about a lot with clients is brain fog and so many people suffer from brain fog based on the food that they're eating. And does this come into play when you're learning these memory techniques? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I am very much guilty of making assumptions for my students. You know, Mm. I assume because I podcast about this every week like you do and I talk about nutrition and I talk about, you know, uh, sleep and on and on and on and on. I often assume wrongfully that people have all their bases covered. Yeah. But we know just, for example, uh, sleep, Mm -hmm. right? If you are not getting enough sleep, you do not learn, period. And I don't care, you know, we all think there's a study that's put around that like 1% of the population can live on less than four hours of sleep. You are not that person. Yeah. Like you're just not, you think you are, but then you're chugging coffee to stay awake. Like you cannot, you cannot function without sleep. You literally cannot create new memories unless you are asleep. And many people don't realize this, including myself. I didn't know this until years and years when I had one-on-one access with some of the best sleep experts in the world. You don't realize, okay, cool, you're doing 90-minute cycles and each cycle has a little bit of everything. But your body will not actually get into REM sleep, which is the part of sleep that we believe is most restorative to the brain, Mm -hmm. until it has finished all of the physical repair of your body. So let me repeat that in another way. Until your body has gotten enough deep sleep of repairing muscles, tissues, 
your vascular system, blah, 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 blah. It will not give you REM sleep. And so oftentimes I will wake up, I'll look at the aura ring uh, chart and I'll see, okay, wait a minute. I had a little bit of a hard time. There must've been some noise last night or traffic or honking outside. I didn't get enough deep sleep. And therefore, you know, I only started REM sleep at five in the morning. I then woke up at five 30 and I will actually go back to sleep. So I'm really hmm. trying to, uh, kind of adapt myself, hmm. um, to making sure that I get enough REM sleep. One, because as I mentioned before, I obviously have a history of depressive uh, tendencies. Yeah. So need to make sure that I am getting enough sleep or I become poopy pants. Hmm. Uh, but also because, you know, my everyday is learning. I learn for a living. That's what I love about my job. So Yeah, dude, that's incredible. Something that we go and do a lot of work with uh, companies is all about sleep and helping individuals, in particular the traveling individuals, with how to how to adapt their sleep from when they're going from one state to another. Um, and it, it's quite interesting to see how many companies are actually really willing to, to bring that on. I think it's super cool that they are willing to invest in their employees. But um, sleep yep. is just such a massive thing. I'm actually exactly the same as you. If, I, if I've not had a good night's sleep, I'll, I'll go and make sure that I prioritize a nap at least in the day, uh, if not multiples. Yes. Um, and that so helps so much. Even on the days when you're feeling pretty decent, a nap is so good. A power nap under 25 minutes, like getting in, getting out can be such a good reset and such a good, like I find such a good, like refocus for the day. So important. Yeah. And so sleep is a big one. You know, I used to always talk about the tripod uh, and say, you know, everything that I teach in all my courses, whether it's productivity, whether it's digital organization, whether it's goal setting, whether it's learning, it all assumes. And, and now we've filled this gap and we have courses on nutrition, fitness. We're building one on sleep. In any case, I used to say it all assumes that you got everything lined up with your tripod, mm -hmm. right? Which is nutrition, movement, and of course, sleep. Yeah. And then I realized uh, through years and years that actually it's not a tripod, it's a table, which kills the metaphor because mm -hmm. the table can stand on three legs. But it really is uh, the table. And and the fourth one being relationships. Yeah. It, you know, you can be the fittest, healthiest, best nutrition. If you are depressed and lonely, that actually has a huge physiological um response as well. I heard it really nicely articulated and I'm probably going to butcher this, but it was, uh, all you need is smile, hmm. sleep, meditation, intermittent fasting. Uh, the L was something love maybe, to, maybe it was love and then exercise. Yeah. But, uh, I don't know where nutrition fits in there. Hmm. So, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And, no, I like it. That's really cool. That's the first time I've heard of it that way. Um, but yeah, there's there's so much in, in the connection side of things. I, I don't know if you've ever read the book Tribe by, um, what's his name? Someone, someone younger. Um, anyway, it's a really good book and it really dives in deep into connection and how from early, early years, like ancestral years ago for, for us, so all of our ancestors, um, how much they just lived in small communities and small tribes and it was yeah. such a big thing and like how how we've transitioned into this connected world that's not actually connected at all where we've got right. thousands of people that we can talk to yet no one's willing to open up and talk to anyone because they're they're too connected exactly. and showing their best life even if it's not actually what life is yeah. I once heard Naval Ravikant talk about, you know, comparing his life in India to when he goes back and visits to his life in the US and just saying, you know, we all he was being interviewed on a podcast at, at the time and he's like, We all talk about the nutrition and the sleep and everything. But he's like, you know, people have become more and more depressed the easier it's become and the more socially acceptable it's become mm. to isolate yourself. Like think about today, if you're a twenty five year old man or woman, it is perfectly socially acceptable to be like, yeah, I'm going to be a freelancer, which means I don't have any long standing relationships at work. I work from home or a we work mm -hmm. in a glass room by myself and I prefer to live alone. I can afford it. Why not? Right. So it, it is now socially acceptable to completely isolate yourself. And, and by the way, I don't even go to the store because I order everything on Amazon Prime. <laughs> and when I am, uh, you know, commuting to my yoga class, I put on headphones or, or I go to the gym, I put on, like, it is possible to not interact with another human being at all. Yeah. 
and and it not only is it possible like no one will raise an eyebrow and he compared this and said like look when i'm in india my family's up in my business like mm. depression takes isolation right if you have a family member who loves you and cares about you and is up in your face saying like hey I, i'm worried about you it's pretty hard to be depressed yeah yeah you know and and of course there's different reasons for depression and it, but uh you you'd have to work at it right if there are loving people around you supporting you saying hey i'm worried about your diet maybe that's what's going on depression takes isolation mm. and uh and and so i always try you know, as much as I'm all about the superhuman biohacks and take your probiotics and all that stuff, I always try to remind people like the, the, in this regard, the hack is that there is no hack, right? Like loving relationships, sleep and nutrition. There's no hack. Just mm, do it. Just do it. <laughs> yeah, no, I love that. And I mean, for, for you, like you're a person that works from home, right? Like you've got your setup. I don't know. I actually don't know if you've got your own office space or, or you're working from home, but Yeah, I go to WeWork uh, yep. once or twice a month for exactly this reason. Like I need interaction with other interaction. people. My wife works yeah. in an office, so I can I can sit at home all day, every day and be alone. And, it, and I used to have a group of people that would like come over, I'd brew coffee, we'd work together. Mm -hmm. But uh, a lot of them, you know, moved, ended up going to companies, started, you know, their businesses grew. So they started their own offices. My business has grown mostly, you know, with employees in Europe, the US and Philippines. So yep. I've had to go to WeWork just to maintain kind of connections. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, I mean, that is a crazy thing. I mean, that's actually, I keep coaching CrossFit for that reason because I want to have that human connection. That's yep. my my step back into the world because otherwise everything is behind the computer screen. And although I get to have conversations like this every once in a while, it's still not probably the connection, the deep level connection that you need to be getting. Um, so, I mean, you a, a fun fact Agreed. is that you live in Israel. So, I mean, you're, you've moved away from your home country. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing like what what's kind of the things that you're keeping in place now to make sure that you are getting that human connection? Connection. Well, that was part of the reason that I came here is I feel like uh, in America, it's become, again, you know, with Netflix and Amazon Prime and all this stuff, it has become really easy to become very lonely. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll never forget, like I was in New York City and I saw, <laughs> this like broke my heart, but I saw this sign in New York City, in Manhattan, and the guy said, if anyone wants to talk about anything, anytime, please just call me. Hmm. And then it, it or if anyone is willing to talk. And then it just said like, signed, one very lonely person in one very big city. And I was like, oh wow. my God. Like in Israel, that won't happen. People are up in your face. Yep. Like the, the taxi driver's like, hey, are you married? I have a daughter. <laughs> and, and, and there's this cultural like, just get up in people's business, you know, where people are like, hey, what are you doing for, for Sabbath dinner? Strangers, like the bank teller. Yep. They're like, oh, you have an accent. Like, do you have somewhere to go tonight? Um, wow. and, and so that's really nice. There's also a culture, like people go out during the week, they get together, uh, for dinners. And so part of the reason was I just felt like there was more warmth and love and, uh, connection for me here. Mm. Um, obviously my, you know, my wife and I try to be as social as possible. It's hard. We're guilty of falling into routine just as much as any other couple. Mm -hmm. But, um, I do find you know, a lot of it is, is cultural. And I think, uh, it, it's up to us, no matter where we live to buck that. Right. So I used to do Tuesday night dinners yeah. because who the hell decided that, you know, you have to go home and watch Netflix after work. Like people in Europe don't do that. In Germany, you go out in Japan, you go out from work with your colleagues, friends, whatever. So, you know, why not get people together for dinner? Yeah, it's definitely the thing that the Western world is missing. Um, whenever I've toured places like Asia or when we were in Europe last year, like it's just so cool to see how busy it is at all times. Uh, whereas in yeah. even in major cities here in Australia, you'll go out on a week night and it's dead. Like it's just not not happening at all. It's it's almost like comes down to just weekends. This is the only time we're allowed to go out and have fun. <laughs> yeah, and you know what's crazy as well is. Um, I saw a study that actually showed, so we believe in the West that if you had a really, really hard day, the best thing you can do is treat yourself, right? Hmm. Like go home, open a pint of Haagen-Dazs, 
put on your favorite show reruns and that's going to like take your mind off things. But someone actually did a study on this and it, it convinced me because I, my wife is Israeli, right? So she Mm -hmm. doesn't buy into that myth. Like if she has a bad day, the first thing she does is go out and talk to her girlfriends. Yeah. Uh, but I bought, I used to buy into that myth and someone actually showed me a study that even if you're an introvert, actually going out with your friends and focusing on someone else is going to make that bad day go away faster. So I started trying it and lo and behold, holy crap, it actually <laughs> works. Like you go out and someone else tells you about their problems or you get to vent about your problems. Either way, you just, you feel a lot better than like bottling it up with Hagen dazs <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I've always liked the the saying like um, you can move any of your problems by making someone smile. It's that that whole concept yeah. of you make someone else's day and your your problems go away. I love that. Right. There's there's also another a technique that I used to use when I was trying to network and meet people. And it's like anytime you feel sad or insecure, do something of service to others. Mm. And it works so amazingly well. Like even in in situations you wouldn't think uh, would work, right? So like you walk into a party, you don't know anyone, you feel insecure. First thing you do is go straight up to the host of the party and be like, Hey, what can I help out with? You know, I noticed you're running low on, uh, on beer. Can I run out and get some or something? You immediately feel better because yeah. now you have a purpose and, and it works in every situation. Uh, so it's pretty cool. It's pretty almost, cool hack. Yeah, definitely. It's almost like once you have that purpose at the party, people are almost more interested in you as well because you're there and you're doing you things. And it's like, well, how, how's this person involved? How, how, yeah, why are they here? <laughs> yeah, and you're feeling secure as well. And, and that radiates. Yeah, I love that. Um, let's maybe dive back into, you, you talked about course designing and uh, how you do it for other people as well when you're doing some, I guess, freelance work or some consulting work. When it comes to designing a course, what do you think are maybe some of the key things that have to have to be in a course for it to be successful? I love that question. So, I start. I started thinking a lot about online courses as my courses started growing and we started getting tens of thousands of people. And I asked myself the question really, really frankly, like, why are people buying this course? Because first off, like, I'm not a memory champion, right? I've never competed in the memory games. I'm not interested in competing in the memory games. Hmm. Uh, and there are people on YouTube who have won memory championships, teaching a lot of the same stuff, if not all of the same stuff, for free. Mm. And what I realized is that people are not paying for information, they're paying for transformation. And what that means is that if anyone can learn anything that I know for free, what they're actually paying me for is curation, it's shortcuts, it's accountability, it's a method that gets them from where they are now to the transformation that they want in the fastest way possible. So what then makes a really good online course is one, that it's very methodical in the order in which you teach it. So we call this, I, I trademark the term, curated learning journey, hmm. right? So I'm not telling you all the information out there. I'm curating and giving you exactly what you need in the exact right order. I'm also making sure that there is a lot of interactivity, that there's a lot of opportunity for you to practice your skills, test your skills, and really getting you off the screen and into practice mode and application mode. Because again, information can't create transformation without application. So Hmm. we spend a lot of time thinking about the interactivity and sometimes it's not easy, right? Like uh, if you build a course on, oh, I don't know, uh, you know, now that I think of it, there's always a way. (laughs) There's always a way (laughs) to create interactivity and some courses it's easier than others. If you're building a course on programming, have people build an app. If you're building a course on goal setting, what are some other activities that they could do besides writing down their goals? Like maybe an activity can be partner up with someone and critique their goals. You get the idea. So there's yeah. always a way to make interactivity. Um, and I think that's the first and most important thing that you need to do when you create an online course is just realize what people are paying you for. We all think it's like you ever meet a, a 
startup entrepreneur who's building an app and they think like the idea is so valuable they don't want to tell you unless you sign an NDA. <laughs> yeah. They're like, dude, if, if if the idea were the hard part, we'd all be billionaires. <laughs> like no one gives a shit about your idea. It's the execution. You know, there were 10 ride sharing apps out there at the same time and yet only Uber and Lyft worked. The idea was worthless. So the, the same is true of the information in your courses. Like there are maybe some really, really rare people out there who know something that literally no one else in the world knows. Like if you developed some crazy algorithm for stock trading that literally no one else knows in the world, fine. But for the vast majority of us, the information that you know is out there. You learned it from somewhere, right? So someone else learned it as well. And so you really need to think about the value of the course as being the experience and the journey, not the information. And that changes the entire way that you would build a program. Mm, yeah, I love that. That's really cool. That's, that's got my head ticking. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, so, I mean, maybe we should start to wrap things up. Uh, this has been super insightful. I would love to ask, I guess this is a really good question to finish on is, is there anything that I should have asked that we haven't covered on yet or that I didn't ask you about? Yeah, I heard a really good question. Someone asked me and I love it and you're free to borrow it for your podcast as I've borrowed it for mine. And the question is, how has the subject, how have you changed the way that you teach what you teach over the years? And I think that's so interesting because it really begs the question of like, what have you learned along the journey that you had wrong when you first set out as a teacher? Yeah. And for me, the case is, it feels like every time I revise one of my programs or improve it, I'm making the memory parts bigger and the suit and the speed reading parts smaller. I'm moving the memory parts up and moving the super the uh, speed reading parts further and further back. Because what I realized over the years, watching we're now over two hundred thousand people who have taken our courses, wow. is that speed reading is a really cool, sexy trick. You know, it's <laughs> like the six pack abs of uh, of Going to the gym learning. Yeah. Yeah. But but at the end of the day, like you know, as a CrossFit instructor, like six pack abs are kind of the least of your concerns. Like, are you strong yeah. enough? Are you fit enough? Are you do you feel good? Do you have mobility? Do you have joint pain? You know, six pack abs are like the cherry on top. Yeah. And really the transformation is everything that you do to get there. So I realized that speed reading is this amazing tool, but it's a tool. Whereas learning how to tap into your memory, that's like a complete operating system upgrade. Hmm. Yeah, that's cool. I love that. It's uh, it's definitely like, yeah, that's like the key. <laughs> it is, yeah. It, well, there's no learning without memory, and uh, and you know, sometimes even I get tired of talking about memory, but it it really is like it's the super skill, because once you can trust your memory, you now have a net to fall back on, and you can really learn anything. Yeah, that's really powerful. Well, Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us. Um. I will. I will. Oh, me, man. Yeah, I'll list a whole heap of your details in the show notes. But where can people follow along on Instagram, for instance? Um, I think that that visual side of things that you're talking about is definitely something that people enjoy, um, and it can be that little reminder of, oh, that's the memory guy. That's the guy I should be going and doing the Superhuman Academy through. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. My Instagram is entrepreneur and the end is spelled N-E-W-E-R. And then our company's is Superhuman Acad. I'm Love pretty it. sure. <laughs> that's so good well thank you so much dude I really appreciate it I think the listeners will really love this one um, there's a lot in there and awesome, I feel like friend. people just need to go out and get the book or just jump on the, the academy really like either way is going to help with you and your own progression as an individual so I think that's what at the end of the day all of us want like you, you like you said before it goes back to that that why with individuals and it always comes back to um, to self-love or wanting to be seen to some extent right Bingo. Yeah. The book is $7 and 49 cents guys. I'm not getting rich off it. I, I just really want to get the skills in people's hands and you can check that out at superhumanacademy.com slash book. Love it. Thank you very much. Visit the chieflife.com for all of your nutrition coaching needs, your own personalized meal plan, as well as how you can get involved with one of our seven pillar retreats.